Hi there, I'm Johnny Anderton, and today I'd like to talk to you about four things. A roof, a bridge, cruising around the world, and a shack. And what I'd like you to do right now is close your eyes, please. And imagine that you're drifting along in a sailboat on a turquoise sea past tropical islands that are fringed by sandy beaches and beautiful coral reefs. It's a stunning, stunning scene. And now I want you to imagine you're living in a cold, leaky shack, enduring a harsh Cape Town winter, the long nights of freezing cold and pitch dark. You can't cook because your firewood's wet, and you can't sleep because your blankets are soaked. And when you want to relieve yourself, you have to go outside into the cold and squat behind your shack in the bushes. And I don't know if you find that a nightmarish scenario for yourself, but I know that if I was in that situation, that's how I would view it. You can open your eyes now. Thank you very much. And that's actually the situation and the reality for William and Gloria here. They're truly amazing people, and I'll tell you why. Because William had a stroke some years ago, and both of them are partially sighted. But they managed to survive with so little in such a crazy place. Shack fires, floods, minimal water and sanitation, and you know what? They are still able to smile. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about them in a minute. I'll tell you a bit more about their story. A bit about my story. I was born and brought up in Cape Town, and I went to medical school here and became a doctor. And then in 2000, uh, sorry, not 2005, in 1985, <laughs> I, yeah, it would be surprising if it was 2005. In 1985, I left and went to New Zealand. The reason why I left uh, was actually partly at the time. I had two, two years in the army to do, and shooting kids in townships wasn't actually my thing. So I ended up in New Zealand, and uh, I spent 10 years there working as a general practitioner. And at, during that time, I met my amazing wife, Claire, who's in the audience. She's asked me not to point her out and say, you're over there, and stand up, please. Um, <clears throat> and in 1994, we decided to buy a sailboat and go sailing around the world. And this is what it, that looks like. Absolutely fantastic experience, as you can imagine. But in 2005, I've got it right this time, we came back to live in Cape Town with, by that stage, our two daughters, Meg and Abby. They're also in the audience today. I won't point them out either. And uh, <clears throat> we settled in Hart Bay in this glorious valley in Cape Town. And we moved into a lovely house, and I started in general practice. But I soon realized that, in fact, in South Africa, despite the fact I'd been away for 20 years, there were some things that hadn't changed much at all. And this photograph is literally taken a kilometre from where I live in my lovely home, staying across the Hart Bay Valley, and I think it speaks volumes in terms of the disparity in our society, uh, which was there in 1985 and is still here in 2013. So what I did, I left medicine, as you do, and uh, started to uh, work on building, uh, on an, a uh, sandbag building method, that was uh, environmentally friendly, and that was going to be used for low-cost housing. And in fact, this building here isn't a low-cost house, it's a 700-square-meter school in Burundi that we built with NGN Petroleum, and uh, it's the largest sandbag building in the world. However, we never actually got to build low-cost housing with uh, this technology for a whole variety of reasons, which at the time I thought would upset me, but in fact, in retrospect, it hasn't. Because I really have uh, reached the conclusion that the whole approach to low-cost housing in this country is completely wrong. The reason why, if you look at the figures for uh, currently in Cape Town, around about nine or 10,000 government houses are built uh, every year. And the backlog? 400,000. We're not going anywhere very fast. And urbanization is a massive, massive problem right across the globe. 
Currently, half the, the uh, world's population actually lives in urban areas, and by 2050, two-thirds will. And as we speak, there are a billion people living in slums. So we have a big problem. And this is what Madiba said. Happy birthday. Urban areas are the productive hearts of our economy, but the majority of the urban population live in appalling conditions far from their places of work. And like so many things, how right he was. What do you see when you look at this slide? Do you see thousands and thousands of shacks with no space for anybody to live, just crammed in together? Absolutely. And that's what I used to see, but I don't see that anymore. I see opportunity. I see a huge resource. I see acres and acres of space. And that's not made by bulldozing all those shacks down, as has happened so often in the past. So where is that space? Well, it's the roofs of thousands and thousands of small houses. And I said I'd talk about a roof. This is the roof. It's the roof of this small house, which we call an Ikaya. An Ikaya means home in Zulu. I believe that this little house is going to help solve some of the housing crisis problem that we face today. Now, I want to go back to the tropics for one reason, and that is to say that it's not all plain sailing. And the reason it's not all plain sailing is that sometimes, you know, as a family, you start with two, Claire and myself, and then there's four. And when you're living in a small space, boy, then you really know about small spaces. So we had to become more self-reliant. We had no washing machines, no babysitters. And the other thing is that when you are on a boat, and particularly when you've got children, and you're in the middle of the Atlantic, and you look around and you know that there's no, whoops, no land for a thousand miles in, any, in uh, any direction. One of the things you have to be is supremely practical. And it was really that experience that led me to develop the Ikaya, um, which is what we call this, the small house. And there are three core, core features to this house that I'd like to tell you about. And I believe that's what makes this really game-changing. And the first one is, as you see it there, the, the, uh, the frame. It's a, a frame around which the sandbags are, are tied. It's reusable, so it's taken out after construction is finished and used again and again and again. And it's the frame that makes these little houses uh, possible to be built with no building skills or virtually no building skills whatsoever. The next thing is the, the walls. They are very narrow and therefore space-saving, which is very unusual for a sandbag structure. They are insulated. They are uh, they're actually even bulletproof. <laughs> they are fireproof, they're floodproof, and it makes the houses very quiet. Now, you'll see the roof there. That's arched, self-supporting, and insulated. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. And it's arched because, like this bridge in Venice, it makes it extremely simple, it makes it extremely strong, and it's really extraordinarily cost-effective. I was talking about how fireproof these walls are. We had this blazing inferno going for an hour, at probably eight, estimated 800 degrees. And on the other side of the wall, just six inches away, there wasn't virtually any temperature change, one degree. And that was after an hour. And the sandbag core wasn't damaged in any way whatsoever. But really, it's the roof that is the key to the Akai being I think, a game changer. And the reason for that is that it's a financial key. Uh, it makes these, these homes income generating and therefore owner financed or possibly owner financed. So what can the roof be used for? Well, it's a really, really strong support, as I said. You saw three of us standing there. It can be used for mounting solar panels. That turns the Kai into a power station, which can then uh, supply lighting and, and cell phone charging to perhaps even the shacks in the area before they're all replaced by uh, Ikaias, of course. Um, and uh, it could run an internet cafe downstairs or perhaps even a, a homework center for kids when they come back from school to learn in a quiet environment with light and, and the appropriate uh, power for electronic um, technology and so on. Um, it can also be leveled, the roof, and again, because it's so strong, that area could be used for growing vegetables, it could be used for raising chickens, uh, and the eggs would then be for sale. It could even be used uh, to rent out to a trader uh, for a store. It's a secure space, and it would work quite well for something like that. Um, yeah, Ikaias can be extended sideways and upwards. 
And it's this really that creates those income generating spaces. An important part of the whole Ikai project is the Ikai entrepreneur who will own possibly five frames, rent them out to uh, his own clients in his community, and then help them to build their homes. And the next week, he's renting out the same frames to help five more people, and so on and so forth. And there are, are other income generating uh, opportunities and job creating opportunities. For example, uh, the making of the window and door frames, or even recycling the polystyrene foam that we use for making the roof. And, uh, of course, that reduces the city waste stream um, in terms of landfills. Now, where does the minimal capital required come from for, for these structures? It comes basically from the um, microfinance organizations like Kiva in the US. Uh, the microloan can be repaid really over about 36 months. And after that, remember, it's all income. And because it's all income, that, those, person, those people who three years before had perhaps no income and no skills, they now have both. Now, I believe microfinance and microbusiness opportunities are the key to unlocking the enthusiasm, the energy, and entrepreneurship that does exist in townships everywhere. And we know that this can work because it's worked in Bangladesh with the Grameen Bank. And it can work here. We're also working on uh, simple technologies like uh, uh, dry sanitation systems. They contribute, contribute to privacy, to hygiene, they also contribute to dignity, and that's not just the shack dwellers, remember, they also help the, uh, our local politicians who've been flung with flying feces uh, recently by protesters. So, uh, another simple technology we, uh, we're working on is the, the uh, inbuilt stove that can be used for cooking, space heating, and it can be used for, uh, for water heating. And uh, this is carbon, uh, carbon neutral, it's incredibly simple to operate, it runs really efficiently on twigs and leaves, and it um, is, is, is highly cost effective. Uh, it can be made in the community for, for probably less than uh, 500 Rand. So what does the Ikaya cost? Around about 9,000 Rand, and that includes the solar lighting. And that roof I've been talking about, about 900 Rand. So the whole package, less than one-tenth of what an RDP government house would cost. So now, for, this is a big figure, lots of zeros. Four and a half billion Rand, one of these, You. could have made half a million of these. And if you think that perhaps there would be two, or well, mum and dad and two kids in each Ikaya, that's two million people. And I have a lot of difficulty in, in envisaging two million people, but if you had to sit them all down at the same time and watch the same football match, we would require 40 Cape Town stadiums. So I'd like to come briefly back to William and Gloria and, and their story out in Blue Downs. Their community decides to build them an Ikai because they're disabled and they feel that they were worthy of this. So on the Monday, we start to fill the sandbags, but actually the project almost, is almost canned before we, uh, before we begin. There's lots of sandbags to fill, to, but loads and loads of grumbling. It's hard work. And that's because the apathy of living in a shack for years and years, unemployed, would, I think, get to anybody. But we all persevere, and the frames go up on the Tuesday and the Wednesday and the Thursday. We actually, on the Wednesday and the Thursday, we actually build the walls up to roof height. And on the Thursday afternoon, we're ready to form the roof, and we're ready to plaster the walls. And for me, the really most amazing thing was tangible energy and excitement that that community uh, uh, demonstrated as they realized they could actually build a house. It was really an incredible, incredible moment. And I believe, you know, well, I asked the question, what if this infectious energy could be multiplied a thousand times? Would our cities be very different? How different could they be? Life does have its challenges because that was the Thursday. On the Friday, this partly built home was threatened with demolition by the authorities. And two months later, we are still in the same situation. And since then, every single time it's rained, I have a little knife in the side of me when I think of William and Gloria in their situation. <laughs> Excuse me. When I know that they could be warm 
and dry and safe. And it's very ironic, because ICAI has been accepted as a flagship organization for the Western Cape government 110% green campaign, and we've been shortlisted for the bridging divide uh, component of the Cape Town World Design Capital 2014. And if there was ever a time we need to bridge the divide, this is it, I believe. We're not going to just lie down and accept the unacceptable. We're going to achieve what we set out to do. And what we have begun at Blue Downs, I believe, is going to have a ripple effect far beyond this little forgotten community. And I'd like to ask you to ask yourselves what you can do to help improve your cities for the lives of all who live in them. What you can do to bridge the divide. What you can do to see one, to do one, to teach one. Thank you very much.